We are joined on this episode by a filmmaker, a journalist, a seasoned film festival director, a programmer, attendee, whose short films have played in nearly 200 festivals around the world, including Fantasia, Austin Film Festival, and Sundance. She is the founder of Other Worlds Film Festival and currently serves as the artistic director of Iglyph, the oldest queer film festival in the Southwest. She is Bears Rebecca Fonte. Bears, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, we're excited to have you and uh, just jump into all things uh, film festivals and filmmaking. And it's it's really fun because you've done a little bit of everything, it sounds like, in the film world. So I uh, can't wait to get into your perspective. How we usually start, though, is just asking how you got the bug for, for film and filmmaking. Was there a particular movie, a play, a show, or a friend that got you interested? Or for you, was it more writing and journalism first that led you to it? Interesting. Well, my background, strangely, is in theater. I was a stage director. I actually went to graduate school for that. So I went all the way to the ends of the earth uh, to attain a directing degree and then decided that I didn't really want to direct plays anymore. I wanted to do film because I was such a perfectionist. I was frustrated by the fact that my actors would change their performance uh, on a day-to-day basis. And I was also writing, too. I was writing screenplays. And so I knew that the only way to really do anything like that is to just go into film. So... Yeah, I started, I basically became a filmmaker at age 27 or 28 after going all the way through graduate school. Whereabouts in the uh, country did you go to that school? Uh, Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Land of the Hoosiers. Land of the Hoosiers, exactly. (laughs) Uh, Were you into movies uh, before that, growing up? Or was it mostly purely theater that you were initially drawn to as a child? Uh, I'm one of these people who would, you know, when the first time I saw Rushmore and he was putting ridiculous things on stage that were movies and should never be on stage, that was me. My junior project in college was I did Taxi Driver on stage in which we went to a junkyard and disassembled an old taxi cab and reassembled it on the middle of the stage with working headlights, um, which we blinded the audience with. So I was always doing crazy things like that. I did an entire uh, Monty Python flying circus like best sketches from that out live on stage in high school so i think i just i always love the form of film and television and the writing and and just i wanted to put it somewhere where i could do it so that's why it ended up on stage so it sounds like storytelling just in general was kind of what was drawing you to all of it you know performing arts whether it was on film or written word or theater I have to give credit to my little sister. Uh, I have a sister who's four years younger than me, and uh, I was a latchkey kid, so I was left alone with my sister many hours a day, most of the weeks, and uh, I would have to entertain her with all of her stuffed animals. So I would create these elaborate stories with the various dolls and stuffed animals that she had, with backstory, and there were people who were married and getting divorced, and there were, there were revenge plots and all this stuff that I had no business telling my sister who was like seven but that was uh that was how i became a storyteller and then my very first movie was actually a camcorder uh film that i made starring my sister's doll and the autobiography not autobiography the biography of ty cobb i was reading because ty cobb was such a jerk i decided he had to be the (laughs) villain in this film and so the book was walking around doing things um to the doll yeah that's awesome. That's a- <laughs> Some of my first, I guess, forays into filmmaking and storytelling were also with toys and my brothers growing up. And we had wars, right, with our Legos and Barbies and all of that. And some of it ended up on you know, VHS camcorders. <laughs> and it's degrading somewhere unless you unless you figure out how to transfer it over. Yes, uh, there's somewhere. I, I recently bought a, a VCR at Goodwill. <laughs> So I'm I'm trying to go back and find uh, some of these projects. So your first, that was your first film. How about your first professional not recorded on a camcorder with dolls (laughs) movie? As you transitioned out of theater, what was your your first project? Um, I had done this, uh, I had written this monologue for stage uh, called Smurf number 47. And the joke was, you know, they always did the dance of the 100 Smurfs, but there was only like 32 Smurfs that had names. And so I was always wondering, well, who were the other Smurfs? And at that time, Smurfs were basically gone. And it wasn't this, you know, now they now they have movies. At the time, when I wrote this, um, the Smurfs had been off the air for like 15 years. So I wrote this First, it started as a monologue, and then I expanded it into a short film of about 12 minutes called Smurf Number 47. And it was all about this Smurf who didn't have any job skills because he wasn't handy. Um, you know, he didn't, ha- he wasn't 
particularly brainy. Uh, and he was out in the real world and he couldn't get a job because nobody wanted to hire Smurfs. And it actually ended up becoming this story about racism in a strange way. Um, and it, it was helped by the fact that the guy who played the Smurf was this um, incredible poet, like slam poet. And he just brought this energy and like anger to the role that just really made it really fantastic. So that was my first film. Um, and it played a couple festivals and I just, that was a trial by fire. I had no idea how to make a film. I didn't know how to use a camera. And uh, we shot it sort of off the style of like the office. So. So making your way from theater to that kind of zagging into filmmaking, did you, did you see yourself as just becoming a filmmaker or did the writing and like the journalism become just a secondary bit for you? Or was the, the goal always to just kind of stay as a filmmaker, writer, director? Um, I think it was, I was always going to be a writer director because I, I like to write. I like to create my own stuff. I, I like to collaborate with people and write scripts together. But even those projects would be like, well, we're going to write this together, but I'm going to direct it. So yeah, that, that, was, that was always a big part of it was to have control of the final project and, and make something. And then when I started really getting into it, I also learned to edit so I could do that too. Um, so now I usually write, direct, and edit my own films. Awesome. So Let's talk about festivals and kind of your first experience there, uh, you know, taking, I assume, was your first festival experience attending one or attending with a film that got in? Uh, can you tell uh, us a it, bit about how you got into that world? Yeah, um, it was attending a festival without a project. Um, I was a script reader for Austin Film Festival uh, back in the early, early days, like 2002, 2001. And if you read enough scripts, you got a free badge and then you got to go to the four day, um, essentially screenwriting workshop. Austin Film Festival is an interesting festival because even though they have movies, it's less about the movies. It's more about this big, you know, weekend, four day long workshop, you know, forum that they have. They bring all these amazing writers and um, it's really inspiring. I learned, I learned a lot and I went like three years in a row. And I remember each year I had less patience for what I was listening to because I was like, I should not be here. I should just be making something because they were all saying, just go out and make it. And I was like, I should just be making it. Um, and so after three years of that, um, that's when I moved out to LA to make something and to like get more involved in, in the world. So I, I had that experience in festivals. And then fast forward about three to four years when I came back from LA, um, because my wife hated LA and did not want to live there. Um, we moved back and um, I was doing post-production on my first feature and I got back involved with Austin Film Festival. And I was just going to be a reader again because I was like, well, it's fun to read scripts and get a badge. And I thought maybe I can help. Um, and and within two months, they had hired me into the programming department as a film programmer. Oh, that's that happened so fast. That's <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, I mean, though, years of work before that, obviously, to get you there. Um, definitely want to talk a little bit more about programming. So looking at your resume, there's also just an impressive list of festivals to your name as a filmmaker. Uh one of them, you know, that stands out, obviously, is Sundance, which is kind of every filmmaker's bucket list, right? Yeah. Uh, so one of your films, were you a producer on it, a uh, writer-director that uh, got into Sundance? I was a producer on that one. So that's my one where it's like I did something for the credit because there was a really brilliant writer director who I, I loved and he had had a couple projects at Sundance and he told me this idea um, that he wanted to do. And I said, that sounds insane. Uh, let me help you with that. And um, <laughs> and then it, it was insane. And then it got into Sundance because it was insane. And then it won Sundance because it was insane because every other film there was sort of a sad film. And this was a film about tying somebody to a bench and lowering a butt down onto their face so that they could be farted on and like directly into their eye as a torture film. Wow, that sounds like a journey. <laughs> right? it's, a, it's three and a half minutes of ridiculous um, torture porn, but it's like the most yeah absurd torture porn um, that you've ever seen. It's called The Procedure. <laughs> We couldn't believe it when I got into Sundance and then we couldn't believe it even more when it won the U S narrative short competition. Congrats on that. either. Just <laughs> find a surprise. It's a, it's a nice surprise. Yeah. Yeah. As uh, is that coming down on somebody's face, but yes, exactly. And that film played at something like 400 film festivals, something insane like that. And um, was Vimeo short of the week and got a lot of press. So it was, a, it was a nice thing to have my name on. And uh, it was really great to be able to help out a, a filmmaker who I believed in. 
Uh, we will talk about this year's Sundance a little later because there's some stuff to bring up about how it had become digital and such. But when you went to Sundance with the procedure, how did that compare? I'm assuming that one was in person. Yeah, that one was in person back in the back in the day when we used to gather, you know, <laughs> together in one place. <laughs> before times. How, how yeah. is a Sundance comparatively to other festivals? I know it's a different animal in a few regards. It really is. It's a, it's a giant festival. Um, I think that when you go to Sundance as a filmmaker, there's very little time that you have to do anything other than just represent your film. It's just so big and it's so important for you to meet people and be at all your screenings and you'll have six or seven screenings. That's really all you can do. And it's hard to get around Sundance. I mean, it's actually not that hard to get around, but it's not like it's all in one place. So everything takes time. Um, a lot of other festivals are organized around, you know, they're all in one one cinema and you get to spend time meeting other filmmakers, seeing other people's work and, and like finding future collaborators. At Sundance, you really just have to go with it um, and just be in the moment and just, you know, be as selfish as possible, really, because there's very little time to do anything else. I've attended once, uh, not with my own film, but just attending. And you're right about it being more difficult to get around than others. Like there's a lot of transportation options, but you have to factor that in, right? That you need to take a, a shuttle or a bus or whatever to get um, from one venue to the other, as opposed to everything being in centralized location. So I, I definitely feel that compared to Fest, like Fantastic Fest, right? Where it's like one hub yes. and everything's there. So spread out. And I designed my festival, Other Worlds, after that Fantastic Fest model. I never want to have more than one venue. I want everything to be in the same place because then you can come back into the lobby after every movie that you see and talk about what you just saw, uh, share with the community, and then go back in and see a different movie and then come back out. So I think that's it makes it a much more enjoyable experience to go to a festival that way. And it makes it easier for filmmakers to meet each other. Yeah, we definitely have some questions about kind of your inspirations for other worlds and as well as kind of your experiences as a filmmaker impacting it. So you kind of let us into that. But before we jump into that, I don't want to go too far without talking about programming at uh, the Austin Film Festival, uh, kind of jumping back to that. Can you tell us what a programmer does and kind of what perspective you brought to the programming team? Sure. Um, every festival is a little bit different with how they approach films and how their film team works. Um, but I would say that all the festivals that I have programmed or worked on have sort of worked the same way in which there's a, a pre-screening team, or you just call them the screening team because pre-screening sounds offensive, like nobody's actually screening your film. So there's a group of people who are usually volunteers who watch all the films that come in at other worlds. That's something like 400 films at Austin Film Festival, that's something like 5,000 films. Um, and they watch all those films and they rate them. And then once a film gets a certain number of yeses, then it goes to the programmer and the programmer will evaluate the film um, as whether it's, you know, something they want to consider for the festival. And then you end up with, you know, three weeks before you have to announce your program, you usually end up with 200 films that you like and 35 slots. And so as a programmer, your job is to put the 35 films together that you think both represent your vision for what you want the film festival to be, what if you have any theme, if there's something on your mind that you want it to be, if you want to use it as an opportunity to push people in any sort of social justice way, or it could just be as, as much as like, well, these films this year, I really, I got really excited about things that are like fast. Um, it doesn't matter. And it could just be good films. And, but you also, it's really important that you, as a programmer, are making sure that your choices are inclusive and representative. And by inclusive, I mean, you know, because your programming team looks a certain way, they might be more apt to program films that look like they're made, that are made by people that look like them. Uh, that's why for years and years, we had film festival programs that were just films made by white men. And we're finally changing that by having more diverse members on the programming team. But it's important as a programmer that you be aware of the talents you have and the talents you don't have and make sure that your program includes a little bit of something for everyone or else it's not a complete film festival. That's obviously if you're doing a non-niche festival. Now, if you're doing like Cine Las Americas, which is the fantastic um, Latin American film festival that we have in Austin here, um, you're really only going to be considering films that are in Spanish. Uh, so that's so that's making it inclusive. And the other thing I, I always push for is for it to be representative. And by that, I mean, you're not going to play a film about uh, growing up 
in the wrong side of the tracks in Philadelphia with a hip hop artist that's made by some white guy in Portland, Oregon, who's never been on this side of the Mississippi. You know, you want to make sure the stories that we're telling are being told by the people who deserve to tell them. In the LGBTQ community, which is obviously a part of where I am from, it's really important that we make sure our stories are told by us because for years they haven't been. So that's something. If it's a queer story, I want to make sure that the writer, the director is is queer um, so that I know it's a legitimate voice. So it sounds like with the various festivals you worked at, you have a slightly different headspace for each one, whether it's broad or niche. Going back to what you'd mentioned earlier about Other Worlds Austin, you want to be inclusive, but you also have that niche. You created basically a sci-fi film festival. I wanted to ask what what was kind of the inspiration for that? I know you'd mentioned having the single location, but what was the greater inspiration for a sci-fi film festival? Yeah. Uh, well, when I was at Austin Film Festival, you know, we, we did have access to you know, at the time it was somewhere in the high 3000s. I think now they get like 5,000 to 6,000 uh, films a year. But I, there were so many great sci-fi films and sci-fi is my favorite. It's just my favorite uh, genre. And I would have room to do one program of shorts full of sci-fi um, and maybe one program of shorts full of horror. And we did 10 programs of shorts, which is a lot of shorts. Most film festivals don't do that many shorts. So even with that, there was still a ton of great science fiction films uh, that weren't getting to screen in Austin. And, you know, it's very hard to make a film festival of the quality of Austin Film Festival or South by Southwest or Fantastic Fest. Usually your film has to be amazingly solid, usually has to have a lot of money spent on it. And with places like South by and Fantastic Fest, you have to know somebody there. And programming is, is um, it's, it's a hard game for filmmakers to realize that when you go to a film festival like Sundance, 70% of the films are being made by people who are already alumni of Sundance or worked on a film that was uh, made by an alumni of Sundance. So there's, it's getting recommended. So I started Other Worlds because I was like, there's just too much great sci-fi. And if I don't play it, People in Austin are never going to get to see it because people don't go watch short films. There's no way to see them. And yeah, you can watch them on YouTube, on your phone or on your monitor, even on your 52 inch screen TV. But that's not the same as watching it in the big screen with 5.1 surround sound. It's not the same for the filmmakers. So my idea was we're really serving two communities, the community of filmmakers who are making this great material, getting out of the world, who need to have that interaction with the audience to know if their stuff is, is reaching, to know if it's landing, to make their talent better, and to meet other filmmakers so they can collaborate and network. And then the other half of the community is the Austin filmgoers and, and the larger sci-fi fan base in general. We now have people coming from all over the country to come to other worlds just because we are one of the few film festivals that really really focuses on sci-fi. And we have people, we've been doing it for nine years. There are probably a good 25 people who have been to every single festival since the very beginning, which is tremendously a, an honor for me. You know, it really, it tells me that we're doing something right and that they want to keep coming back. Um, that makes me feel really good. So starting one up in a town that, you know, has a few long running, well-known festivals, what was the, maybe the biggest challenge of starting a new fest in a city like that? And maybe did the built-in genre scene kind of help or did it make it more difficult to stand out for you? It is hard in Austin because there is something going on every single weekend. So the first thing we had to do is figure out how do we put our festival in such a place that it will still be able to get some attention and that it will not compete with any of the major festivals that I knew filmmakers should try to get their film in. I always say if a sci-fi filmmaker has a short and they can get it into South by or Austin Film Festival or Fantastic Fest, they should play those festivals. I don't want to steal their screening, you know, but if they submit there and they still don't get in, then really we're the best form for them. We, we may be a, uh, the best form for them to reach sci-fi fans anyway, because lots of times, you know, certain screenings, if you're, if you're doing shorts program at Austin Film Festival, it may be just other filmmakers there. You might not actually have any fans. Um, you may have, you may screen for 20 people if it's a, at a bad time. Our screenings are always full. So I, I had to think about calendar. And then I also had to really mark 
you know, like really think about what our territory was and not try to do the things that we weren't going to be good at. So for the first two years, we were just science fiction. And then we started adding horror. Uh, but when we added horror, it was sort of this elevated horror, like scientifically based horror, horror that was, you know, built around an interesting premise. It wasn't slasher films. It wasn't gore films. Um, and these were things that we weren't seeing getting picked at South by or Fantastic Fest. So I knew that they were still an audience for them because people couldn't see them. So I never felt like we were in competition with any of those festivals. And I've had programmers from all of them come to our fest. And I still go to, I still go to South by and Fantastic Fest every single year. And, you know, if there's every once in a while, there'll be one, I think each one of those festivals, there'll be one film each year when I'm like, darn, that would have been one I would have loved to have played. Um, but, but, you know, good for that filmmaker because they, they got to play South by. I really appreciate you bringing up also the timing of it and the strategy of, you know, getting in, well, if you don't get into this fest then play this fest and there's a lot to think about there. And besides holding screenings as a single, in a single location, were there other experiences as a filmmaker that impacted your, your whole approach, you know, such as thinking about the filmmaker's perspective in terms of strategy with getting into other genre fests? Yes, I had the benefit of both working for several years at a film festival, so experiencing it from that side, and also taking my first, um, I'm going to say my first successful film, because Smurf 47, you know, played two or three festivals, but I wouldn't consider it a success, and it doesn't really represent my talents. My first film that I did that really got out there was called The Secret Keeper, um, and it was a 17-minute sci-fi short, and um, it played about 30 festivals and they were all over the country and I traveled a lot with it because it was my first film that was really getting into festivals. So I had an amazing time, but I also saw some really poor ways to run festivals. And so I came back with this idea of like, well, if I'm going to do it, I want to make sure I do it right. So some of the things that I made sure that we always had um, was uh, no barrier between the filmmakers and the and the audience. So no, they don't have separate seating areas. They're all in the same place. We don't, we expect filmmakers to come for the whole weekend and be at all the other screenings and meet each other. Um, that's the sort of an expectation of coming. And we plan events with um, filmmakers and, and um, the audience where it's specifically intended to be a time when the audience gets to meet them. So um, because I loved meeting people who were there to watch my film. That, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to tour the film. Another thing that I, I knew I needed to have was a really fantastic um, picture and, and sound system for every film. We had to play in a real theater with a real projector um, because there's so many times I went to a fest and I would find out that it was, you know, screening in a, a library or, um, you know, in a cafeteria or something like that. Or like one time I went to a festival and it was literally on a television on one of those like AV carts from elementary school like a 24 inch wow. TV. <laughs> and I was like, are you kidding me? I flew here for this. Um, and so then that became a big thing for us was transparency. Uh, we were very big on, this is who we are. This is what we do. If you, this is how we score films. We show everybody our rubric. We say, if you don't get into the festival and you want to know like what people thought of your film, like just contact us after the fest and we'll, we'll give you the feedback. Um, we don't like feel like that needs to be hidden. Um, so all those kind of things, we really wanted to kind of open it up. We said, here's the programming team. These are, these are the people who are watching your films. We don't have a necessarily a screening team. We have 10 programmers. They're all equal. Um, so you can meet all of them. They're all on Facebook. You know, you can see what we like and, uh, you can come to the festival and we're around at the festival the whole time. You can talk to us. And that's like really great for uh, filmmakers who didn't get in to come and, fe and feel well what happened or filmmakers who are ready to make their next project and they want to get inspired. So. That's awesome. That sounds like there's so many ways for people to still engage with a community of you know, filmmakers, sci-fi lovers, et cetera, that even if you don't get in, like you said, just not to have so many barriers between the filmmakers and the audience. Uh, I think it's a, a great way to really um, give people an experience that they want to come back to and feel less like there's uh, some sort of hierarchy. Mm -hmm, exactly. And it helps that you're, that we're small, you know, like yeah. because we know exactly how many seats we have. Um, I will only sell the number of badges that we have seats for. So we'll have three theaters, you know, and maybe it's 135 seats in one, 89, another in 77. 
seven in another. I add those together and that's the number of badges we have. So if you get a you get a badge, you have a ticket for every single screening block. You have to pick you get to pick one of the three films and maybe you won't get your first choice, but you've got a ticket for everything. So you don't need to worry about, you know, missing something. And we don't sell, you know, we really don't sell one off tickets. Only if there's an open space will we sell a last minute rush ticket. So you know, people are getting an experience for the whole weekend. So they stay the whole weekend and then they meet a bunch of people. And that's um that's really special. I don't know any I mean, the only other festival that's like that that I know of is Fantastic Fest. And I'll be very honest, many, many things that I did at Other Worlds stolen directly from Fantastic Fest because I had such a good time when I went there. Oh, yeah. I've, I've only had the pleasure of going to Fantastic Fest once. But yeah, it is it is a great experience. There's always something to do. And yeah, you know, the, the way they they host the screenings, you, know, you don't have to you know stand in line for an hour wondering if you're going to get in <laughs> to the movie. It's it's a great system. Exactly. So at the top, we had also mentioned uh, that you're an artistic director at a Glyph. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, what an artistic director does? We talked a bit about programming. Now tell us all about artistic direction for a I, festival. I think it's a fancy name um, <laughs> for, a very, for a very similar job. Although I would say that um, as an artistic director, one of the things that I think about is the whole experience of somebody coming to the festival. And that can mean getting really involved in the poster design and how that's going to be represented on the programs. Um, maybe it's the shirts, the shirt selections, but also more than just films, you know, I'm programming panels. I'm, I'm programming talkbacks and one-on-one -on -one conversations. I'm programming readings, all sorts of things like that. So, and I'm programming not just parties, but specific networking opportunities for filmmakers. So it's some of the same things that I, I do at Other Worlds simply because I started it. And, and so I put all these things into place, but coming in as an artistic director to a festival that already exists and already has some of the things it does, um, you have to really think about, well, why do they do these things? What, what do they get out of this before you change anything? And if I'm going to add something, what am I adding? Why is it necessary to add it? And you know, how, to, how to make it feel part of the already existing fabric of the festival. For, with AGLIF, um, which stands for the All Genders, Lifestyles, and Identities Film Festival, um, I'd been on the board of directors for five years. Um, so I knew the festival very well, and, I, and I'm becoming to the festival for 10 years. I, I started going to the festival when I was at Austin Film Festival just because they were our, our neighbor, and we would program a, we, every year where I would program a film that the artistic director of AGLIF could come over and do the QA for, and then they would do the same thing. I would go to Aglif and do a Q&A for them. And so I'd been coming for years and joined the board to help out, came out while I was on the board because I was in the closet when I was at Austin Film Festival. And um, and then the more involved I got with Aglif, the more I decided that um, like I really wanted to, you know, guide the festival. So when the, when the job opened up, they just came to me because I was on the board already. And they were like, hey, this seems like something you should be doing. So given this uh, varied experience, both attending and working various positions at these festivals, do you have any advice to share with some young independent filmmakers regarding festival strategy? We've heard some folks say that, like, find the right genre festival for your film's genre, or find the right timing. But what, uh, what would you give as advice maybe for folks who don't know how to play the festival game quite yet? I have so much advice because one of my other jobs I do is actually I am a film festival consultant. So filmmakers hire me to help them pick which films, which film festivals to submit your film to. One of the things I really try to get everybody to know is that your film isn't for everywhere, but there is a film festival for your film. There are so many film festivals out there. You will find a place that is interested and is a good match and you'll find a good audience. So it is about reading what a film festival says they're looking for and what they are excited about playing and looking at their past history. You want to pick something that seems like they could have played it last year, but isn't the exact same film that they played last year. You know, so you don't want the same exact plot, but it seems like it'd be something that could have played. Um, so know your festivals. And that goes into even when you submit because there's the opportunity always to write a cover letter. And there's no reason why you shouldn't write something very specific in that cover letter about why you submitted to that festival, you know, because they may not know that even though I'm not from Indiana and I didn't grow up in Indiana, I actually went to college in Indiana and I 
have three Indiana graduates in my film, and we all know about 45 people within a 20 minute drive of your festival. So we would love to show our film there because we can pack a house. Um, anything you can tell the festival director or the festival programmer about why they should program your film that has nothing to do with the film is great. If you have a personal story about why you wrote that film, about why that film was the perfect thing for you to make, you know, maybe it's a film about um, an alien civilization dying, but you were inspired to write it after your you know, mother had a long bout with cancer. You know, I want to know that story. That's not something I'm going to be able to see on screen. So make it personal uh, for you and for them. They want to know that you picked their festival out of all of the other festivals. Don't write a cover letter that just sounds like it's insert film festival here. You want to say, I want to have my film programmed with you because of you are who you are and I am who I am. I think that's a fantastic tip because yeah, if you look at it like the film is the resume, why wouldn't you attach a cover letter saying, like you said, why, why this festival? The same reason you want to say why, why I'm right for this job. Exactly. So what are some of the biggest mistakes you see filmmakers making when it comes to trying to get their movies and the film festivals? The biggest one is that I just see so many filmmakers make, which is that they submit to a lot of festivals that are the big, big ones and they spend a lot of money on those festivals. And then they run out of budget for submitting to festivals before they get to the kind of festivals that actually would be interested in their film. And I do believe that every filmmaker should at least submit to Sundance once so you can get that Sundance rejection letter. It is a badge of honor. I have five of them, but uh, be realistic with your film. Not every film is, is Sundance material. Not every film is going to play Chicago International Film Festival. It might be better for Chicago Underground Film Festival. Um, so really, it's the same piece of advice, but, but you can really hurt yourself by submitting to the wrong festival in t that town. Like, for example, if you have a really good film and you wanted to play Chicago International Film Festival, but you already submitted and it got into, you know, the great Midwest Windy City Filmathon, which I just made up, but like, when it plays there, then the Chicago International Film Festival isn't necessarily going to want to play it. In fact, they won't want to play it. So uh, a big mistake filmmakers make is submitting to smaller festivals in the same town first or not realizing like the order of what festivals are more important. It's, you got to research every, every festival in town. Like you need to know that if you're submitting your film to festivals in Austin, there's a good reason why the calendar goes south by fantastic Austin other worlds don't submit to like ethereal film festival, which is like, you know, somewhere in the middle there because you're going to make yourself ineligible for all the other festivals after that. Uh, and you maybe had a good enough film to play fantastic fest, but you'll never know because you just ruined your premiere status. Uh, no festival wants to play something that's already played their town because one, if you've come, you've already like depleted the audience for, um, that film because you've already got brought all your friends and, and two you're probably not going to come again every film festival wants you to come to their festival why are you going to make two trips to austin if you've already if you've already played there so that's an easy mistake that can be avoided just do your research and figure out you know come up with a circuit make a list know the dates that the submission it's not just when the submissions are it's when the festival is playing and submit in order of of festivals that, that you want to play yeah, you know, a little due diligence on your part will go a long way as far as not seeing what might, like you said, become ineligible the second you put it into a smaller fest right before Fantastic and it's already had a Texas premiere, for example. Exactly. I wanted to ask before we kind of jump into a little Sundance recap with you, with all the work you now do, I mean, you were the festival consultant, the <laughs> end-all be-all, I think, for, for festival knowledge. Do you intend to kind of work on any more features or shorts or filmmaking at all? Is there even a balance to be had there or are you now just uh, bearsfestival.com? It's really, it's, it's hard. Um, one of the reasons why I left Austin Film Festival originally was because I, want, I didn't, wasn't having any time to make films. And so for several years, I tried to do a short film every other year because then I, it would get me out on the circuit and I could, you know, not just have the joy of making films, but also have the joy of going to other festivals and seeing what they're doing and being inspired and, you know, meet all of my, you know, I guess my, my, they're not my coworkers, I guess my people who do the same thing that I do. Cause there's, if you don't go to another festival, I won't necessarily meet the director of film quest out in utah but i go to that festival every year and we're now really good friends so i sort of had gotten that that habit and then covid hit so i haven't made a film for a very long time and i've been itching 
And I just actually got an offer about a month ago to direct a feature and um, I'm going to go shoot a feature in May. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to be able to do that with running two festivals, but I can't say no because the re- whole reason I got involved in festivals was as a, you know, a secondary with my film career as a, as a maker in the same way that I got involved in journalism as a secondary, as a film festival programmer, because I can see more films if I'm a journalist. So, but that it all goes back to wanting to be in the, in the industry and wanting to make films. So if I don't take time to make films, then it's not worth it for me. So it, it's a balance and I'm hoping that I find it this year. Um, it's going to, it's going to be a struggle, but I, I'm going to try to make it work. Well, good luck. That's going to be a lot to uh, the balance on the plate, but we, we believe in you. Thank you. Yes. Congratulations and, and good luck. But you, when you're passionate and you love, love this stuff, you find a way to make it work. And it sounds like you will be able to do that given everything on your resume. We have faith. <laughs> it, it also helps that the project is like um, the original script came from the woman who's going to star in it. And so she's also going to produce and she's really excited. So it really helps that I don't have to be the only sort of motivator on the team. Um, so there will be other people who are kind of driving the wagons. And um, so it's a little bit of the shared responsibility, which when you do a short, it's really the only reason a short gets done is because you want it to get done. Yeah. It's nice to have those other champions kind of helping uh, carry the weight, (laughs) pushing things forward. Uh, So as Sean had mentioned, we do want to talk about this year's Sundance, which was at least the in-person element of it was canceled late into the process uh, with the surge of Omicron. But it sounds like you had a chance to attend virtually. Um, I did. I, yeah. I had I had reservations to attend in person. I was I had plane tickets. I had an Airbnb. I even had a rental car. Um, unfortunately, uh, I was able to cancel all of those eight days before the festival when we found out that it was going virtual. So not the same. Obviously, I've been going to Sundance since 2012. So I miss being in Park City. I miss the snow because I grew up in Chicago. And so Sundance is the one time of the year that I really get to be in the cold and wear a winter jacket and enjoy that sort of cold air. Yeah, but it's better than nothing. To, to yeah, yeah. At least you got to see some of the films. Are there uh, any standouts uh, that you want to share with us? Some some films that uh, kind of blew you away or surprise favorites? One thing that uh, I loved... You know, it's, it's funny when I go to Sundance, there'll be films that I'm like, oh, this would be so perfect if I could play it at Other Worlds, knowing full well that there's no chance that the film will either still be available, like hasn't played a festival in Austin yet, or a lot of times with Sundance films, they've already made it to the theaters. So like a film that I love that is actually playing South by is called Master. And it is all about a, um, like an old seven sisters type college on the East coast. And this uh, woman who takes over as a Dean of a school. So she's like a house master and she's the first black woman to have that job. And so she's, basically um, in a institution that has a long history of racism. And then there's a couple students um, when we see their experiences coming to this college, a couple of black students. And what we come to realize is that uh, there was various murders at this uh, school in the previous years, and it's being haunted by the first witch you know, so-called witch, uh, who is a black slave who was murdered in 1690. And there, it's just a whole mess of like, don't build a college here because it's haunted. And it was really freaky. It definitely felt like a little bit of get out mixed with higher learning. Um, I really, I really loved it. I know that that that's a perfect film for Austin because it, it created so many conversations and I'm glad the South by played it. I'm glad that the filmmaker is getting that representation, but, uh, oh, I, I would have loved to have that in other worlds. Be on the lookout for that one for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want a, a documentary choice, I saw an amazing music doc um, called Meet Me in the Bathroom. I don't know if that's playing South by. It should be. If it's not, I'd be surprised. But that one is about the um, late 90s, early 2000 music scene in New York, which was basically happening like in and around the ruins of the World Trade Center, like America trying to get itself back together. Uh, music was at kind of an all time low. If you want to look at it from a creator's standpoint, you had a lot of really bad post grunge bands and, uh, you know, white angry guy rock. Um, and into that mix came bands like the Yeah Yeah Yeahs and the Strokes um, and LCD Sound System. And so it's all about kind of how music changed uh, and, the, and the whole scene in New York. And I just found that fascinating because it was like having a, you know, a bird's eye view of 
being there and, and meeting all these people and, and being a part of that, that scene. It was, it was really cool. I didn't realize they had, that's a book that I own that I have not yet read that was recommended to me after uh, someone was telling me I'd read the book, uh, Please Kill Me, which is about the, a similar thing about the punk scene. And that was recommended as a book. So I bought it on a whim. Uh, have not read it. Didn't know they turned it into a documentary, but I'm, I'm fascinated to see it now. Yeah, they did. I guess the book is like 600 pages. <laughs> it's, um, it's not small. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, this, I, this easily could have been a mini series. You know, it could have been six or seven episodes, but uh, they did a good job of, um, of containing it and really telling the stories of really three bands with a couple on, on the sidelines that, to, that helped tell the stories of those three bands. So that was a really, that was a really cool film. Nice. Before we uh, jump to the second half of this, I do have one thing that's kind of in the back of my brain. I've been thinking about you're you're such a veteran of festivals. You've been going to Sunday since 2012. Do you have that one kind of standout moment? Like you hear stories over the decades from like Pulp Fiction to Parasite of just there's certain special screenings that just like blow people's hair back. And you kind of know it's a windfall moment or like a turning point moment. Or like, oh, I'm going to know this guy's name. I'm going to know this filmmaker's name or this this movie is going to be around. It's going to have a staying power. Have you been in the screening that felt like that where you're like, this is the next yeah. filmmaker star movie? that we're going to be talking about for a long time. I've got a really great uh, example for you because when I was going for Austin Film Festival, it's the only time I was really going with the energy of watching short films because I was trying to find, you know, fresh up and coming filmmakers and get them to, you know, consider Austin Film Festival and submit their film. So I went to a shorts program and I saw this amazing 18 minute short about a guy who was sitting in for his first day uh, as a drummer in a high school jazz band. It was called Whiplash. And it was the 20 minute short version of, of the movie that got made two years later. And you could tell from that very beginning how amazing the energy was from that filmmaker, from Damien Chazelle. Um, it blew me away. And I, I knew it was going to be a feature. And it turned out that actually it was already written as a feature. They had done the short to kind of as proof of concept. Um, but I didn't know that at the time. At the time, I, I just thought it was just a new story. And uh, I, knew, I knew that that was going to be a special film. So that was, and I, there was a couple ones like that. There's another one that was called Palimpsest which was about uh, a house tuner, somebody who would go into your uh, house and listen, and they could tell you like your refrigerator is vibrating at a different frequency than your toaster. And that's why you don't feel right. And um, I, I just found it to be the most amazing story. And at the time I, I struck up a friendship with the filmmakers. I brought them out to Austin film festival. And then like seven years later, they finally make, got to make uh, the feature version of that. That's very cool that both your uh, examples happen to be shorts that you knew were special enough that they'd be turned into a feature or were already in the process of. Yeah. You know, I'll give you another one too. Same thing. Um, uh, the stylist. Jill Gazavarian's yep. film I saw as a short at Film Quest and it blew me away and I was like I this has to be a feature and at the time it, it wasn't it wasn't even planned for that but she, you know she just came out with that film last year and in one of the great things that I did get to do I was I was able to play the feature at Other Worlds and bring her in uh, for a screening at, which was really great because it had played Fantastic Fest the year before but it had only been virtual so they hadn't gotten to do a screening in town and so I felt like that was special enough um, that I could bring her in and Bria Grant, who's a Austin, uh, was an Austin based actress for so many years um, and bring her in for the screening. And that was, that was really special. So I love having that moment. And then, you know, having several more interactions with that filmmaker down the line where finally I get to bring them to my theater and share them with my audience. Yeah, both the uh, previous guests of the show, both Bree and Jill. And we had Jill <laughs> on actually on the debut uh, the week the stylist went to VOD. So that was nice. cool. we'll talk to her about it too and see the short as well. Yeah. We are back here with Bear's Rebecca Fonte. She's taken time out of uh, wallpapering her room with Sundance rejection letters to join us here for <laughs> Rapid Fire 15. Becky's favorite uh, thing. She likes to tell people it's neither rapid nor fire, but a little bit of a questionnaire we, we briefed Bear's on ahead of time. It's uh, kind of like a Prowse questionnaire, but genre bent to what we learned about you and your taste. So if you are okay with it, we will jump right in. Let's do it. All right. First question. What movie do you think you have seen the most in your life? Uh, that's easy. It's Monty Python and the Holy Grail. At one point in time, I had counted that it was 131 times. And that was when I was in college, which is well over 20 years ago. So I know I've seen it a few times since then. Uh, I used to watch that film every, every week, I think, of my life, um, pretty much since junior high. 
It's almost like you read our minds. I'll, it's I'll almost let Sean like do this. she mentioned something earlier that made me change question two. What is your personal favorite Monty Python sketch? Was that really? Is that really? really why I, I added that to question two after earlier you said you uh, did the Rushmore esque kind of uh, plays <laughs> yeah. and stuff. Yeah, no, my favorite one is the dead parrot sketch. Uh, Classic kangaroo. Yeah, uh, no, actually, no. I have to change it. No, my favorite is the Spanish Inquisition. Also classic. No wrong um, answers, in my opinion. With no, this. no, but that one, like, I could still do that. I could still do the line from that. So, um, from doing it on stage when I was a senior in high school. The whole, like, the whole I could stage. do it from hearing people on the bus growing up doing that sketch. <laughs> I just, I just love, I just love it. So, yeah. All right. Next question. What is your favorite universal monster or universal monster movie? Uh, you know, I think I'm partial to the original Frankenstein because I, I, I think there's so much in there. Um, but I did just see Creature from the Black Lagoon and uh, I like the design of that. And I also love that it's a, it was designed by a, a woman creature designer. I think it's the only one. And that's, that's kind of exciting. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it a tie between, between those two. And I know everybody likes Bride of Frankenstein, uh, but I just, uh, I like the old classic. Um, the original Frankenstein is, like, I remember watching it when it would be on like almost every Saturday afternoon on like TBS. I guess, probably from growing up. And so it was always something fun to watch. There's something about the simplicity and the tragedy of the original Frankenstein that just hits you in all the right spots. And so good. I've seen so many versions of Frankenstein, and yet I still go back to that one if, if, in my mind. You know, when I think of Frankenstein, mm-hmm. that's the Frankenstein I think of, not Same. the, you know, Robert yeah. De Niro or, you know, any of these other ones. Yes, there's a litany of really bad ones. <laughs> There are some bad ones, but the, the hammer one is good. You know, I don't know. There's some that are better. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a great Frankenstein called the terror of Frankenstein, which is a fake like spoken word track to the original movie where they made up like all the facts about the movie. Uh, Rodney Asher did it. And it's this really funny thing about like recording the, the film and all these people got murdered on set. And, you know, it's a complete lie. They were just basically like bullshitting and making it up. But it's unbelievable because the story plays out in this creepy sort of tension building way. It's a, it's a great way to watch Frankenstein again if you haven't, you know, if you're like, well, I've already seen Frankenstein. But this way you're, you're watching the story of Frankenstein and hearing an entirely different horror story at the same time that looks i've never heard of that from 77 i'm gonna check that out it's a real fun watch yeah we got to have that at uh, other worlds several years ago nice next one what is your favorite horror movie franchise Ooh. um well i'm a child of the 80s so um it's probably nightmare on elm street because i was a lucid dreamer and i you know freddie's terrifying but he's not nearly as terrifying as the things you come up with in your head and uh, the effects on that are great for the time, for the practical effects. There's some great performances in it. And, you know, I got to say that like not, not knowing it at the time, but going back now and thinking about being exposed to Nightmare on Elm Street 2 and the male hero, the, the one and only uh, final guy, I think that really, I love that. And I didn't see any problem with it uh, at the time. Like it just made sense. And I, and I feel like because I had that experience, I was, my eyes were more open to other possibilities in horror. Um, and I, and I never, people would rip on that film all the time when I was a kid, because, you know, we were all, it was the eighties and we were all homophobic, which is a shame, but it was true. Um, and uh, I remember I was, I would defend the movie and they'd be like, well, it's so gay. And I'd be like, I, well, it wasn't because he wasn't in the movie, but also it doesn't matter. It was a good film. It was scary as all hell. When he rips the guy's top of his head off and you see the brain. I mean, all the, I, that, that was terrifying. I'm going to guess you've seen uh, Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street, because that movie's had a big reassessment, obviously, in recent years and yes, decades. Yes, um, yeah. I saw the world premiere at Inside Out in Toronto, nice. and I, I met the Scream Queen himself, Mark. He was there. He was really inspiring. Yeah, I that film lives on in my mind for a number of ways. I think it's one of the most, uh, it has the least amount of time on screen for Freddy of all the nightmare films. Every time he's on screen, I think he's in some ways it's the most terrifying, just like the whole body horror concept of it. It leans much more into that than some of the others do. And and it also has one of the best scenes ever of, you know, Mark's character dancing and closing the dresser drawer with his butt, which is just so cute. (laughs) cute. And you know, before it's all before Freddy became like uh, quippy one-liners, you know? like yep exactly it wasn't a comedy it was it was scary 
you know, and also the age I was when I saw it, it obviously it, it affected me. I remember having to sneak copies out, uh, you know, into my house from renting them because I wasn't supposed to have that kind of movie at home. All right. Question number five. What is your favorite horror movie subgenre? I suspect it might be sci-fi horror, but yeah, it's it's obviously <laughs> sci-fi horror. It's funny though because I think of sci-fi horror as a subgenre of sci-fi, not mm. horror, because because it, it's it is all in how you define things. Like for me, sure. sci-fi is all about um, the things that we build or the places, the discoveries that we make that make us feel powerless or more alone. You know, it's the things that we do to ourselves that end up twisting on us, right? In horror, it's about the nightmare that already exists and we, we kind of know about it and it comes and gets us. So like a movie like Alien, that's so much more a movie about going somewhere and messing something up. You know, you, you don't just land on a planet that you don't have any information on and pick up a darn pod that's got goop on it and not expect to have your face sucked off. It's just dumb, right? But that that's not horror. I mean, horror would be like, you know, the, you're in the neighborhood and some guy breaks into your house and throws a pot on your face and it's like, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I would say that if I had to pick a actual subgenre of horror, it would be kind of pagan folk horror. I mean, obviously the one that comes to mind that everybody loves now is Midsommar, but like the Wicker Man, all those kind of things, because I don't think there's anything more frightening than, than uh, the common man who believes they know something uh, and is willing to do whatever it takes to, you know, realize that belief. And that goes, that's pretty much all religions, whether they're pagan or Christian. Um, I just don't, I don't trust it. And that's terrifying to me. So you end up in a place where it's you against the institution and the institution is something that people believe so fervently they're ready to kill for it. Uh, that's terrifying. Agreed. Who would you say is your all time favorite director? I will tell you that there are many directors that have done great work that have inspired me, but there's only one director that seems to be able to do any film that he wants to, even films that you don't think he should be able to do and, and does them effectively. And that's Spike Lee. Um, the first film I saw that changed my outlook on life was Do the Right Thing. And I think that it's you know, there's a lot of movies that Spike Lee made around that time that uh, are very personal for him and, and really deal with, you know, issues that you would expect Spike Lee to be able to make. But then you go to something like 25th Hour or The Inside Job um, or the one about the World War II soldiers that find the miracle statue. And then he did that remake of the of the Japanese horror film. I mean, oh, boy, yeah. Like literally Spike Lee can do anything. He just knows how to tell a story and how to get good performances from actors. And uh, I, I would see anything that, that he ever made. Uh, maybe he does documentaries, you know I mean? Like I can't even, I can't think of a bad Spike Lee movie. Uh, and um, yeah, I used to go to all of his films in the theater first time um, in uh, when I was growing up in Chicago and it would be electric to be in, in those crowds on the opening weekend because uh, you didn't know what was going to happen. You know, you knew he was going to challenge you uh, in some way. And, you know, now he's finding different ways to challenge us. I think he's challenging himself because he wants to, he wants to make every movie he can. Um, it's, he's definitely my, the filmmaker that I am most impressed with and that I, but he's, I wouldn't say he's like the biggest influence on me as a filmmaker, but he would be the one that, that I would say, like, if there's only one filmmaker that can enter into the filmmaker hall of fame per year, and it's my year to choose, it's him. Awesome. Good choice. Uh, every Spike Lee film to point is different. And I like that you said they all challenge you. And that's, that's a great uh, statement to make about someone's work. I think it's the ultimate compliment. So switching gears, we talked quite a bit about horror. What is your favorite sci-fi film or favorite sci-fi franchise? It's really embarrassing. Um, oh, no, it's no. not. We don't believe in guilty Why pleasures. It's Demolition Man. It's the Ooh, greatest demolition film. man. It's the greatest film ever made. It has You're the greatest on this cast. podcast. <laughs> Don't worry. What's that? You're at home on this podcast with Demolition okay. Man. <laughs> I've actually done an entire podcast on the greatness of Demolition Man um, on, on another podcast. Um, you know, it's it's funny, and, but it actually really is about a bunch of things. It's really about what happens when society goes too far to kind of control the way you think. And 
and the performances are great. I mean, it's just, it's, and the world building that they do is just so amazing. I, I watch that movie at least once a year and I always find new things um, to enjoy in it. I can't believe they never made another one. And I can't believe it wasn't really regarded as like absolute genius when it came out. To me, that movie should be on the same platform as like Star Wars, Aliens, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I feel like people dismissed it because of the cast. And now I think people are starting to appreciate it a bit more. I, I hear people frequently reference the film now. Uh, and maybe some of it's nostalgia, right? Like the age a lot of us tend to be at right now, where we're going back to those films that maybe grew up watching when we were younger. Who knows? Maybe I think, we'll... I, I think you're right that people are starting to reassess Demolition Man, because I, I would say nine years ago when I started the festival and we had that question on our our like get to know the film the film team and it was like what's your favorite sci-fi movie and i put demolition man and i remember people being like what and now i feel like people just be like yeah cool when we were looking up some stuff about you for this i saw that was your your favorite one on the other world's profile everybody's profile has like favorite sci-fi and you have all the usual suspects of 2001 a space odyssey and then there's bears with demolition man <laughs> i was i'm glad to know you meant it Yes, I yeah, I just I just put it out there. Uh, you know, my wife knows when we're when we're channel surfing. If we hit that movie, it stays on, and there's nothing there's nothing that can be done. We just have to finish it, even though I own it on Blu-ray. Next question: As I suddenly crave Taco Bell, what is your favorite sci-fi novel, or maybe series of novels, sci-fi novels? So it's kind of a strange one um, because. For most people, it's a fantasy series, but not the way I read it. So there's a really great fantasy series called The Dragon Riders of Pern, which is about like a kind of a medieval kind of quality culture that where people harness dragons and they ride around in dragons and they fight. And um, it's really well loved in the fantasy community. I didn't read it in the order that it was intended, that it was written. I read it out of order. So what I read first was the prequel, which is all about how this planet evolved, where this basically people were escaping Earth and going to set up a new colony on another planet and they crash. And it's all about, you know, their first several days and years on this planet. So by the time you actually get to what the first book of Dragon Riders of Pern was, they don't even remember how they got there. Uh, and I found that to be fascinating. And I would love to make that film. I'm, and I don't think anybody really pays attention to that. It's Anne McCaffrey, um, you know, great female sci-fi and fantasy writer. And uh, I don't know if anybody has the rights, but if anybody's listening to this has the rights, I want to make that movie. Nobody else does. And I'm the one who should do it because I would do happening in present day with the dragons and everybody like living in their medieval society. And I would do it simultaneously with the origin story and just, you know, just see what happens when the world changes. Nice. As a fellow sci-fi fan, I mean, that's my number one genre for sure. I grew up not ever thinking anybody around me was like too rigid about sci-fi and fantasy because so much stuff we love is hybrid. Like you said, I mean, Star Wars being the prime example of sci-fi fantasy, like everything sci-fi people like seems to have fantastical elements. So like, I, I will certainly allow that answer as sci-fi. <laughs> Yeah, like The Dark Tower by Stephen King is another, I love one, that, yeah. that exactly. whole series. And I don't know how I would classify that. I mean, if you think about the multiverse concept, it's very much sci-fi, mm -hmm. but most of the film is a, a Western fantasy sort of. It's funny. Yeah. I just had uh, these memory surges because one of my best friends was constantly reading Anne McCaffrey books on the bus to school every morning. Uh, uh, so yeah, they just jog that memory bank for me. So thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, what is your least favorite Broadway musical and why is it Rent? <laughs> Um, because that story has been told. Uh, it's already, it was La Boheme and the music isn't that catchy. I mean, you know, it did give us some, some good actors, uh, but <laughs> I mean, like my least favorite musical is Rent, um, but only because it got so much notoriety at the time. And there were, I'm a big musical fan and there's so many other musicals that came around at the same time, um, like City of Angels or um, that are just so much more inventive that I just don't think got, the attention bears is going to start a new podcast called 525,600 reasons why rent is not nearly as good <laughs> as everything else in that era you know anthony rapp is on that new star trek discovery yep. show and every so often he'll come on and he'll start saying a number and my wife will immediately go into the song <laughs> right into that song right into that song with whatever the number is so um to mock him but you know like i said he's a he's a great actor i'm glad he survived his time on rent so that he could do yeah. something really quality like um like star trek showing my age here i knew that guy from adventures in babysitting well before he was known as the rent guy i, don't know. I remember that <laughs> 
Yeah. Who's the is it Elizabeth McGovern? Who's the who's the hottie? Elizabeth Shue. Elizabeth Shue. Yes, yes. She was she was a momentary crush when that movie came out. Yes. I, I don't know many people alive that is are my age that don't feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what would be Bears or Becca Fonte's walk up music? So, say you're coming out for your TED talk, or you're coming out to uh, fight Becky in the Fantastic Fights, or maybe you're a ball player or something like that. What are you walking out to? What's getting everybody pumped up to see you? I love that question. Um, I think it's changed over the years. I think when I was younger, it would have been something like Bad Out of Hell uh, by Meatloaf. Uh, but now I think it's definitely got to be The Uprising by Muse. It's got that sci-fi tint to it. And it just really, you know, roars the crowd up just as, as an entrance music, I think. And plus, it's got that theme of uprising. I, I, I like to be the, uh, the underdog and the rebel rouser. So I think that would be that would be perfect. And in a similar vein... What is your go-to karaoke song? Even if you don't do karaoke, if you kind of had to pick a song to go up and perform, what would you do? Um, all right. So a uh, go-to karaoke song would be Inside Out by Eve Six. Do you remember them? They're like a little alternative oh, pop, yes. pop band. We, we I know the song. song. Full of really bad rhymes and like, you know, really strange metaphors um that's a song that it would come on late at night and as i was driving I scream it scream at the top of my lungs so yeah you have to mm -hmm. you have to prove you know that song by knowing every single word to it that's the <laughs> only way that's the only legitimate way to prove that you every you nonsensical that. word <laughs> yes yes i would choke on the rind want to put your tinder hard in a blender we all know it. <laughs> watch it spin around to a beautiful oblivion one last music related question as an author, Glad there's a lot of music related questions. I'm yeah. a huge music fan. Well, like, maybe I, you have an answer for this one then. As an Austinite, what would you consider the best live music venue in town in the capital oh, city? Oh, well, um, or maybe a favorite I mean, spot to check out the show. Well, my favorite spot is gone, as most Austinites will tell you. My favorite spot to see a concert was the old Emos on uh, on Sixth Street. It was amazing, and I would get there early, and I would take a position that was right across the way from the soundboard on the other side of the one step that goes down. So I would I'd be above everybody. I would have a place that I could lean, um, and I was basically like had perfect sound because I was listening to the sound that the sound mixer had. Um, so that used to be my favorite place. That's gone now. You know, I, I would have to say it's, it's not surprising, but it's a ACL live venue. I mean, they spent a lot of money to make sure it sounded amazing, and they did a good job. And there's not a bad seat in there and i go see shows there all the time and i've, I've never had a, a bad experience got another austin question coming your way not about music this time there's a lot to choose from but what is your favorite local spot to eat at or around austin i gotta give a shout out to reality's italian uh grill which is uh in northwest austin which doesn't get enough love reality's is a classic southern italian cooking like kind of sicilian style cooking best chicken parmesan i've ever had it you know any pasta dish they're not going to do something fancy they're going to do something old school and classic like you would get if you're in the movie the godfather um the guy who runs it is amazing tony reality he catered my my wedding and uh catered a number of parties i threw for uh film festivals and uh it's just the best food out there i, I don't know i just there's so many up and coming trendy restaurants in, in austin but i gotta go old school and classic in a place that was here 30 years ago i think we're all ready for dinner now <laughs> I, well, I ordered amazing. italian food too so it's on my mind but unfortunately I, I can't get realities to deliver tonight maybe because it's valentine's day oops yeah we forgot about that <laughs> yeah you, uh, you have a lot of experience working, coordinating, attending festivals, as we talked about. Do you have a personal favorite film festival or maybe a personal favorite festival experience? I, uh, I've gone to two festivals in Scandinavia. I went to the Oslo Fusion Festival in uh, Norway and the Lund International Fantastic Film Festival in Sweden. And both of those were such amazing experiences to kind of get to go to, obviously, another country, but just the way people look at films completely differently and to experience new cities and enjoy films and like, and just be on the other side of the world from anything else. I, I just, I just love experiencing new places. And I was so inspired at both of those festivals and it makes me want to live in Scandinavia, which I may have to, you know, if the Republicans take over again. Um, but uh, it's just a, I think Oslo fusion was the queer festival. So I got to like, talk on a panel nearby at a, at a college campus they had scheduled for me to talk about my film, which was, which was really neat. And um, I saw David Bowie's musical Lazarus performed live on stage, not in Norwegian, but in new Norwegian, which is apparently is a made up language that they invented to teach all the children. 
it was just a crazy experience. So the, the film festival had great st- and and they brought in so many filmmakers from all over the world. I got to meet some really smart and talented people who I've, I've stayed friends with ever since. That sounds like an incredible experience. All right, we've landed on the last question of the Rapid Fire 15. And maybe you already said it, but what would be your dream project to work on as far as a genre, a period, an adaptation, you know, like maybe an Anne McCaffrey novel or a style of movie that you'd love to tackle that you haven't done yet? I mean, I love that Anne McCaffrey project, but, uh, you know, I have a script that I wrote that is my dream project, and it is about evil forest fairies. It's called The Sylvan, and um, it's sort of an environmental horror film, and it's sexy, and it's rebellious, and it's going to be magical. It's going to look amazing. I just have to find, uh, you know, several million dollars to do it. So I keep writing cheaper and cheaper scripts as stepping stones to get to that script. You'll get there. I Thank believe you. it. All right. That concludes the rapid fire. It was really fun. I feel like we learned a lot more about you just in those uh, 15 questions. <laughs> yeah, no, those are great questions. I love all the music questions too. Yeah. We're big music fans as well. So uh, as we're concluding, uh, is there anywhere you'd like to uh, direct people online if they want to follow you on social media or a website that they can go to if they want to you know, hit you up for some consulting on the film festival um, piece? Where would you like yeah. to direct people? If you are a filmmaker looking for consulting, my website is bearsfonte.com. It's very easy to find. Um, and uh, if you're interested in, in my festivals, I mean, you know we're the only other worlds out there. It's otherworldsfilmfest.com or otherworldsfest.com. I, mean, we, I bought 15 uh, addresses that all go to the same place. That's, uh, that's the sci-fi festival. And if it's a queer festival, aglif, A-G-L-I-F-F dot org um, is the other festival that I run. And uh, those are the easiest ways to find me. I don't really do social media. I, I'm bad about that. I, I'm pretty active on Facebook, but I also try to keep my Facebook to just be my friends because I say a lot of really obnoxious things. No, all good. We'll make sure to uh, paperstreetpodcast.com on the episode page. We will have links to the festivals, to your website and such, so that folks can find you if they want to. Awesome. And find that bio that says favorite sci-fi demolition man. It's proof. It's proof. <laughs> Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure, Bears. Uh, I learned a lot from talking to you and for that will help me when, on my next film when I'm submitting to, <laughs> to film festivals. Uh, so really appreciate the advice as well as just learning more about you as a filmmaker, a writer, music lover, uh, Anne McCaffrey enthusiast, all those things. So thank you so much for spending some time chatting with us. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. It was, it was really fun. And you guys have great questions. And, uh, you know, I, f- I feel like I learned a lot about myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. We're glad we can help you. We're hoping we can help some uh, young independent filmmakers out there because you had some very useful tips about the festival game because it's ever changing in these last couple of years with the, the pandemic and such, but just little bits of, uh, of wisdom on like how to submit and where to submit and where not to submit, I think could uh, go a long way for a lot of the folks listening. So we do Absolutely. appreciate that and the time, of course. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Now go get some dinner. Mm. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.